welcome you to our um, VCNR seminar. And I'm really very, very pleased and happy to have um, two exceptional speakers today. So we will um, hear today about patient recruitment data management in this um, webinar um, by um, Julia Macklin-Carrion. And um, I'm very happy to um, introduce um, her now. So um, Julia is a neurologist and clinical trialist um, who holds a master degree in neuroscience and pursued her research training at Duke University and um, also holds a PhD in translational medicine. She's now um, working as head of medical affairs at EP Health, a health tech company that provides digital health solutions for connecting patients, the healthcare system and clinical research stakeholders. So without further ado, I'm, I'm very happy to um, now listen to your presentation. And of course, we'll have some time to discuss. And after this um, presentation, we're going to um, hear the presentation by um, Won Ki Chang, um, who will introduce consort in neurorehabilitation researches. But I will also introduce um, him um, just after the first talk. So please um, welcome Julia Macklin Carrion. Thank you, Professor Sokadar. I, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank Dr. Conforto and Dr. Kim for the invitation. And I believe we will have very interesting insights to share and to discuss. I believe that Christian will play our pre-recorded presentation. And I also would like to encourage everyone who has questions, please use the chat function um, so that no question and no thought gets lost. So if you have any questions, just write them into the chat and um, we'll be able then to discuss these questions um, after the um, presentation. Good morning, everyone in Brazil and good afternoon, everyone in Europe. It is a pleasure to be here today. I am Julia Macklin, and I will be sharing with you some insights on recruitment and data management challenges and opportunities. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim and Dr. Conforto for the invitation. So recruitment performance plays a key role on any trial success and failing to recruit may imply a huge burden for a study or even the study premature termination. In the study assessing early termination of clinical trials registered in the clinicaltrials.gov, the results showed that 7.7% of all trials that have already been finished have been prematurely termination. That means that the original sample size was not achieved. And this is important because in the majority of circumstances that a trial is prematurely halted, a trial that don't recruit the original sample size is underpowered to answer the research question. When assessing the reasons for trial termination, recruitment appears as the main reason 33.7% of all terminated trials have been terminated because of failure to recruit patients. And this reason was followed by other administrative and operational reasons, 20%. So it's clear that the trial design and trial pre-organization settings are key to success. This assumption becomes even more prominent when we evaluate predictive factors for early termination and the funding source being not from industry appears as a major risk factor for early termination. On the other hand, trials with larger sample sizes over 1,000 patients are more prone to be successfully completed. And this 
looks weird and sounds weird because we have been talking about how difficult it is to recruit and the burden of recruitment. So one might think that having a larger target sample size would be extremely difficult and imply a major risk. But let's think that in the majority of circumstances, trials that are really large, they are usually coordinated by experienced organizations and are funded by powerful sponsors. As you observe what is happening in neurology trials, it becomes clear that we have huge opportunities for improvements. Let's have a look at this important and elegant meta-analysis that evaluated stroke trials conducted between 1990 and 2005. Here we observe that while trials over time kept a fairly similar sample size, enrollment duration has increased despite the number of investigator sites have increased as well. So we conclude that recruitment efficiency and trial overall efficiency has decreased over time and this is a major problem. In a subsequent study assessing trials up to 2015, the problem has persisted as we observe in this graphic. So ladies and gentlemen, we still have a problem and we must change the way we think and change the way we work. Otherwise, for the next 15 years, the problem will persist as well. So imagine if we recruit Recruitment is so challenging for more prevalent conditions like stroke or other cardiovascular diseases. Imagine when we talk about neuro rehabilitation that we all know is a different story, a different scenario, a special patients, a different complexity. In this study developed in Brazil, the authors present the challenges faced, as well as other strategies that they have made to overcome these challenges. Look that it took two years, 1,200 pre-screened patients in order to obtain 44 screened patients and 27 randomized patients. So, although the use of multiple simultaneous strategies, as they show here in this first figure, have been proven to be successful to obtain this sample size of only 27 patients, the time effort benefit here and for other trials is questionable because we are spending a lot of time, a lot of effort to obtain small sample sizes for our trials and we all know that to answer answer strong questions and meaningful outcomes we still have to try a larger effort to have larger trials so ladies and gentlemen it is clear that we must change our mindsets and foster new alternatives for neuro rehabilitation trials conduction by optimizing study design operations and empowering patients. How can we increase trial recruitment and data management efficiency? Here we propose this setting of strategies in order to obtain a more successful trial. So by having a pragmatic, smart design and fit for purpose data acquisition, by exploring other data sources, real-world data sources, we could have RWE 
and richer trials. By exploring technologies such as devices, apps, telehealth, and virtual monitoring, for example. And finally, and most importantly, by having a true patient-centered study, by bringing the trial to the patient and applying the centralized procedures. So, have a look at the PRICES 2 tool. This represents an interesting tool that challenges whether we are really designing trial that really fits for real life needs. So questions like, are we really including patients that exist? Because sometimes we set a really, really strict eligibility criteria, making it really hard to find patients. And we might think that if it's being really hard to find these patients, so who am I trying to benefit? What is the purpose of conducting a trial that I don't find the patients? Are we considering all expertises and resources needed to conduct the study? Are we prepared to conduct the study? How can we better embed the trial into clinical practice? And really important, how closely are we following the participants? This is especially important for neuro rehab because we have a very special patient with special needs and challenging situations. So we must take advantage of technologies, of resources that we have to really follow these patients and make them comfortable within our, our trial. By exploring different data sources, we are able not only to more easily find patients, but also to use existing data, thus avoiding double work. Several sources are already being explored in contemporary studies, including electronic health records, consumer data, claims databases, social media, test results, mortality register, registries, public databases, so forth. So today and from now on, data management in clinical trials play an even more important role and a different role so that has been played so far. So using data standards today and improving our capabilities of data management are key. Enabling the development of a unified study database will be a major contribution from data managers. So we can use enriched studies combining retrospective data with clinical trial prospective data so we can have a data-driven design and we can move towards linkage and de-identification of patient information throughout all these different sources like the medical records, the public data sets, CRFs and patient record reported outcomes. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is becoming the new normal for clinical trials. The future is now, the future is not tomorrow. This is reality, this is happening, and this is the era of big data. This can only be possible if we take advantage from available technologies and also if we create new solutions. The path from fully centralized trials where all the study procedures take place in the study sites to hybrid designs and to fully decentralized trials where all trial procedures are conducted virtually. 
demands we design less complex procedures and that we use fit-for-purpose mobile data acquisition technologies. So either whether we are really moving towards a fully decentralized, we don't know yet, but the hybrid designs, they are already a reality. And we should be really smart in terms of trial design. It is not a matter of why we just drop the fundamental concepts of clinical trials, but whether we dominate whether we nail these concepts and whether we evolve in terms of creating new methods and feed for purpose technologies. By developing a decentralized and really patient-centered study, we are able to achieve a faster trial participant recruitment improved trial participant retention we all know that our patients neurology patients we have patients they are special and they need special attention they need a really strong follow-up procedure in contact and by applying these techniques we can have greater control convenience and comfort for this participants as well as really real diversity of trial participation. This is really important for our patients. In other areas like cardiovascular diseases, I and I am a strong uh, advisor that we should look at what others are doing. We should learn from them in these areas, we will be able to move from hundreds of patients per month to thousands of patients per month. This is not a crazy assumption. This is really a real uh, foresight that we have. This, is, this will be really likely to, to happen in a few years. In the rehab, we have, we will most likely move from single or double digit samples that we have today to hundreds or even thousands, but only if we change our mindsets. We really need to bring the trial to the patients and not the contrary. There are more patients willing to participate in clinical trials than investigators able to find them and this must change. Have a look at this proposition for really different direct-to-patient recruitment strategies that we have today, they are available today, and we might use them. Currently, we have already evolved in providing mobile interventions for stroke survivors, for example, Tele-rehab is a reality and has been explored in several trials, but clearly we have a lot of opportunities to explore in other areas such as movement disorders. So we must try to be more creative and try to do something different and benefit other patients and more patients. All this transformation will significantly decrease trial costs and why this is important because the burden of the cost of trials today and the clinical trials in enterprise today is tremendous. So all stakeholders are thinking that we cannot move this way. We can, we must be more efficient. So by decreasing trial costs, we will have more resources to do more research, more trials, to evolve more rapidly in terms of knowledge and evidence creation. And by significantly decrease, I mean we can drop budgets by 
automatically just by not having monitoring, for example. This, is, this would be a major change. Moreover, we will be able to really provide full transparency by giving patients access to their data. Because when we are using more biotechniques to data acquisition, patients can have access to their data. This is something that is not happening today. This is very, very limited today to have real-time access. In several circumstances, the access to data that patients have is just after the trial is completed. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we are experiencing today. A major transformation and a major transformation that we have experienced and learn it mostly because of the pandemic. So the pandemic has fastened all these procedures and the challenges that the pandemic brought to us really forced us to think differently and act differently. While challenges are still here, I strongly believe they are not here to stay. We have a lot of opportunities and we do have resources to change the landscape of clinical trials and trials in neuro re rehabilitation. But we must collaborate with each other, learn from each other and think different. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, we have now a few minutes to discuss and um, well, you can all um, ask your questions, um, but I would also like to ask a question now. I mean, um, what I, I think it's really amazing what we have now in terms of um, digital tools to reach patients, to reach out to patients, also to recruit them. Now, my question would be, we have of course different um, interventional studies um, in rehabilitation where maybe we are not that mobile. So I can, I can um, think about uh, studies where you can really decentralize and you can recruit patients in Brazil or in India and have them um, participating in your study um, depending on how, how mobile um, the, the intervention is. But in some cases, of course, you are not mobile and you need um, to do um, blood drawings and you need to fulfill certain standards to have to be sure that, um, for example, the blood work is done in the same lab and, and all these things. So how do you um, envision here the um, different um, approaches? How, how can we also offer this kind of um, hybrid um, approach to more stationary rehabilitation interventions? Thank you, Dr. Sonikar. This is a really important question and we don't have a, a single answer for that. At this moment, we are learning a lot and we are evolving and happily we are evolving really fast. Uh, what I believe it's, re it's a reality today is that we can decentralize several procedures of our trials, for example, even though we still need to do an insight, uh, an insight intervention, as you said, we can decentralize several other procedures. We can decentralize data acquisition. We can do a, tele, a telehealth follow-up in several visits where we, can, where we don't have to apply the intervention, for example. So we can less, reduce the need for a transportation of this patient. We can reduce the need for every, like, we have 20 visits. We don't need to have the patient for 20 visits, inside visits. We can have virtual visits for several, for several examples. As for the lab tests, we, to date, we, we already have some, uh, some solutions. In Brazil, we have uh, another a startup, a startup that I, I am collaborating 
where we have uh, can have a, a, a platform that provides uh, a, a real a real time uh, blood test and we can like disseminate in in strategic areas so we don't need to uh, transport all our patients yeah. all times and the good thing is that we can have this data automatically set to our uh, electronic data capture so it avoids the double work or triple work or so forth because we are, we avoid the work for the the research uh, assistant or the attending physician to uh, to complete to fill the information in CRF as well as the data manager to check the 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 lab the lab test results because the lab test result is already in our EDC so and it is correct. So this is this is a, a real fast communication. This is possible, of course. This is not widespread. I am. Uh, this is not widespread, but this is possible. This is real. We are already working with some examples for that. Of course, it is really it's much easier to do this type of thing in other areas, such as cardiovascular diseases. I mentioned because I learned a lot from cardiologists. And they taught me to uh, try to think a little bit uh, in a more pragmatic way. And I tried to taught them to think a lot more like a neurologist and say, guys, uh, in neurology, it's another, it's another thing, it's another scenario, but we can exchange uh, experiences and try to do uh, an, an, another type of study. And now just one more short question. If um, like, how do you like? What would be the optimal way to really increase um, the database? So you envision that when you had um, an acute event, you're in hospital, you already get into the system and you um, become characterizable um, as a potential um, participant for a study, and this all digital, and then you. Um, contact um, the patient, um, let's say, in complete other part of Brazil and say, well, you would be a perfect fit for our study. Would you like to participate? Is that what you envision? I envision some things like that. But, uh, for example, the recovery trial that was developed in UK, uh, of course, it's not neuro rehab, it's COVID-19. But as an example of a platform trial with a really, really uh, modern design and really, really modern techniques in terms of data integration, that is exactly what they've done. Mm. All patients were uh, that were eligible and uh, they were uh, they were potent, potentially patients mm. to be recruited. And uh, it was a not out situation. So we can have situations like that, but it depends on the scenario scenario we have. In UK, we, you, you have NHS, you have uh, an integrated uh, national database, so it's easier. In other countries like Brazil or US, the challenge is really, really different. And I don't believe that we will move towards something like NHS. I believe that we will move in another direction where we have the patient as the, the empowered party. So they, as our legislation, our data uh, uh, legislation in Brazil and in US, all patients, uh, regardless of being a research patient or not, they have the right to have access to their data, to right. their medical records. So several institutions, even in Brazil or in the US, they are already moving towards uh, providing each patient the records. So if we uh, think about that the patient is the source, it's much easier than we try to link all institutions. I don't believe that by trying to link all institutions, we will move forward in big countries like mm. Brazil or even the US. In US, uh, people have been trying to do such things for like decades and it doesn't work. UK is another story, such as other countries in Europe. 
All right, thank you so much for your answers. Um, it was really very, very informative and instructive to, to listen to your talk. And thanks again for um, being part of this um, webinar. Thank um, you. I would like to move on now to um, our second speaker, Professor Chang. So um, Professor Chang is a clinical researcher with um, broad experience in stroke rehabilitation. And um, he's, he's currently working at the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at Seoul National University and uh, conducts um, several randomized controlled trials on therapeutic effects on, of rehabilitation interventions, uh, particularly in stroke patients, and has interest in non-invasive brain stimulation and also rehabilitation robotics. So um, we also have a collaboration now between Charité and um, his hospital. So I'm, I'm very glad to um, be able to introduce you here today and look forward to your presentation. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Hello. Um, okay, so it's been on. Uh, it's an honor to present a, a talk on the concert flow diagrams and checklists. And let's see the videos from now on. Hello everyone, I'm Wang Ki Chang from Seoul National University Pundang Hospital. Today I'm going to briefly talk about what is CONSORT and why you should report randomized control trials according to CONSORT. So today's table of contents are all followings. I'll first talk about concert statement and then talk about concert checklist and flow diagram. Then I'll briefly show a few concert extensions which can be implemented when reporting other forms of RCTs. And then finally give some examples of rural rehabilitation studies which adopted concert. So before I begin, the CONSORT webpage gives extensive information and materials regarding CONSORT. So actually most of the materials that will be handled in our today's talk are from this website. So you can visit the website and get more information you need. So for the CONSORT statement, CONSORT stands for Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials. It was initially developed in 1996 by 30 experts comprised of medical journal editors, clinical trialists, epidemiologists, and methodologists in effort to guide and improve the quality of reporting of randomized controlled trials. Since then, it has been updated a few times and the lastly updated version was published on 2010. So we're going to talk about CONSORT 2010 in this um, talk. And the CONSORT 2010 statement includes 25 items of checklist and the flow diagram. The CONSORT focuses on individually randomized two-grouped parallel trials, which is the most common design of RCTs. So trial designs such as cluster randomized trials and non-inferiority trials require varying amount of additional information. So CONSORT extension for these designs, which I will briefly introduced in the latter part. Although most people will use CONSORT in the English version, it has been untranslated into 13 other languages which are available in the website address in the right bottom. So why is CONSORT important to researchers? CONSORT guides the researchers in planning, performing, and reporting RCTs. And although the CONSORT form was developed to raise the quality of reporting of the RCTs, by using it as a guide when designing the RCT can also improve the quality of the actual study. 
In review articles, evidence is that adopting consort has improved the quality of report of RCTs were shown. And for the most important, many journals, about 50% of the medical journals endorsed consort. So on the left side is the article on the percentage of high impact factor articles endorsing concert for reporting RCTs. In results, we can see that about 63% of the journals mentioned concert in the instruction to the RCR section. And 42% mandated the use of concert when preparing manuscript. And also 38 and 39% of the journals also required concert checklist and flow diagram in submission, respectively. On the right side is the ASR guideline page for the neural rehabilitation and neural repair journal, which is a prominent journal in neural rehabilitation section. And then I requires the consult flow diagram and checklist when submitting reports on RCTs. So for the most obvious reason, in order to submit a report on RCTs to good medical journals, it is almost, it is almost necessary to follow consult. So for consult checklist, consult 2010 checklist consists of 25 items. You can download the checklist in DOC files at the website. Checklist items are listed in the order of manuscript construction, from the title to abstract to introduction and so on, and to the other information part. Authors should address the number of the manuscript page where each item is reported. If the item is not applicable in your manuscript, then you should write not applicable or NA on that item. So this is the consult checklist. And as we can see, the first item is on title and abstract. There is the checklist items to look for on, on the right side. You can write down the pages of the submitting manuscript where the item is reported. Uh, this is my tip and uh, following consort checklist when writing the manuscript, especially on during the method and research section, will help you construct a robust manuscript. And so this is the part H2 of the consult checklist. We can go on to the res results and discussion part and then to the other information part such as registration, protocol and fundings. So if you have filled up this consult checklist, then you can submit it with your manuscript to the journals. If you find it hard when deciding what part of your manuscript corresponds to each item, there is an example on the consult website where an example of RCT manuscript is annotated with consult checklists. See also the consult 2010 explanation and elaboration article written by Moore et al which has plenty of examples and explanations on checklists of each item. The DOI and the article information is written in the uh, right bottom. Uh, yes, so that's it for the consult uh, checklist. So let's move on to consult flow diagram. For the consult flow diagram, as mentioned before, consult focuses on two group parallel design of RCT, which is the most common form of RCT. 
so if you are to report a rct with different design then you need to make appropriate adjustment of the consult flow diagram or you can use appropriate consult extension flow diagram and you can also download the consult flow diagram in document file from the website so on the left side is the example of a consult flow diagram i believe most of you and us are very familiar with it the flow diagram consists of four stages enrollment location follow-up and analysis one thing i want to tell is that as a reader of the article the number at each stage can give readers crucial information for example if the number of follow-up losses are huge then there might be a chance or a risk of participants having experienced an acute exacerbation of their illness or harms of the treatment so this flow diagram can give us uh, imply us maybe more information on the study and this flow diagram is often used as figure one or a late figure two in many rct reports uh, there is a criteria of numbers included and excluded at each stage for example if a person was eligible to the study and consented to participate in the study but dropped out due to consent withdrawal after randomization, then the patient should be reported as did not receive allocated intervention due to consent withdrawal at the allocation stage. So in most cases, determining the proper stage is simple and clear, but in some cases it may be intriguing i'll show you a uh, example of a more complex uh, form of consult flow diagram in the later part so consult extensions has been developed to provide detailed recommendations on the reportings of RCTs other than the two grouped parallel design. On the left is the list of consult extensions on the uh, consult website and you can choose the appropriate extension which matches your study design. And although the consult extension may be useful it is not currently widely endorsed by the medical journals which means in many cases it is not mandatory to use consult extensions in reporting your rct so here are some examples of consult extension flow diagram on the left is flow diagram for RCT of non-pharmacological intervention. And as we can see, the allocation stage is modified from the consult flow diagram. And on the right side is the flow diagram for pilot and feasibility trial. And we can see there is screened stage prior to the enrollment stage as you can see the major structure of the flow diagram is almost the same as consult flow diagram so although you are performing or you plan to report a rct other than to group parallel design you can still appropriately modify the consult flow diagram and use it 
So for lastly, we will look over some examples of consort flow diagram in the neural rehabilitation researches. The first article is on the effect of RC, uh, RTMS on the motor recovery in the subacute ischemic stroke patients. It was published on NNR in 2020. The study aimed to investigate the efficacy of RTMS on motor recovery in comparison with sham TMS. So the design of the study was individually randomized to grouped parallel study, which fit, fits with consult. Thus, we can see the consult flow diagram as in figure 2 on the right side. Uh, the second article is the COMPASS trial, which was published on circulation, cardiovascular quality outcomes in 2020. The study was a multicenter pragmatic cluster randomized trial. So as you can see on the flow diagram on the right side, which is more complicated than the previous one. The eligible hospitals were randomized into two groups and there were multiple exclusion of the participants in the intervention group due to its nature of pragmatic study. So in this article, the consult flow chart was modified to illustrate the participants flow of the study. So, for the conclusion, consort statement was developed in effort to guide and improve the quality of reporting of randomized controlled trials. And most high impact journals require efforts to submit consult checklist and flow diagram when submitting reports on RCT. Consult 2010 statement, which is the latest version, includes 25 items of checklist and the flow diagram. And consult focuses on the most common design of RCT, which is individually randomized to grouped parallel trial. So if your study is not a two grouped parallel trial, you can use appropriate extension of consult or modify the consult flowchart appropriately to match your study design. Uh, this is the last page of my presentation and I want to introduce you another website. Although I've talked on consult which can be used in reporting RCTs, there are also a lot of other study designs and their corresponding report guidelines. For example, if you want to report a systematic review, many notable medical journals will require you to submit Prisma checklist with the manuscript. If you plan to report case reports, then you will have to submit care guidelines or care checklist with your uh, manuscript to the journal. So I've uh, put the website uh, on the website uh, on the right left on the right bottom page so you may find valuable information on the equator network website on other forms of reporting guidelines too uh, thank you for listening Wonderful. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. I think we might have had some technical glitch sometimes. So some people had problems to see some of the slides, but um, it resolved after a while. So um, I hope you all could, um, um, well, get get the main messages out of it, even not maybe seeing one, one or two of the slides. So we have now time for a discussion. Um, and Maybe 
um, I, I would like to underline, I, I also gave one, one um, talk um, in this webinar where I was um, uh, talking about um, replicability and repro reproducibility in science and, and how important it is to have a certain standards. And I think these, um, these consort um, is really a very important um, um, aspect that we, we should include. And of course, there are also other um, initiatives that are pu pushing these standards um, forward. But I think the consort is really um, doing very good work. Um, and there are also now discussions about extending it, of course. Um, so if, if you want to publish in any of, I think there are now 600 journals, top journals who are um, endorsing the, the um, guidelines. And um, so I, I would really like to um, encourage you to have, have a look into it and really plan this um, in, in your studies to, to follow this because otherwise um, there might be some, some problems later on in the process. Um, same with um, pre-registration and all these uh, things that are really important for um, quality in research. So we have a little bit of time now for a question. So um, is there any question that uh, you would like to ask Professor Chang or also um, Professor McClintarian, if, if you, because we still have both speakers here. You can just um, unmute yourself, I think, or you can write into the chat. Can I make a quick comment? Absolutely. On, yeah, on Dr. Cheng's uh, presentation. Thank you very much. It was a magnificent presentation and a very, very important subject to, be, to discuss. And I would like just to add some thoughts on Dr. Cheng's presentation and Professor Sokadar uh, commentaries now is that the, the issues on the concert and as well as trial registration, this is really, really, really important because we have evolved into the, the uh, being, uh, we need uh, to have the trial registered before any participant joins the trial. This was 2005 and we have evolved some things don't really happen as we at attitude but in terms of the high impact journals if we if you are not like uh, on time with these if if the concert statement and the trial register they are not matching just forget it we will <laughs> you won't be able even to be uh, assessed for uh, for for uh, publication. So this is really, really hard, and you don't you you don't pass the secretary. It's not that you don't pass the the reviewers, the peer reviewers that we all know they are really hard. You don't pass the secretary. So uh, one must take in uh, have in mind that all the information are in the protocol. So we using using strobe, using using the spirit, using all the uh, the, the checklists for the protocols are really important because once you start the trial, you just cannot change what you have thought uh, later. So don't make a mess and <laughs> think about everything before you start doing, before you start enrolling patients. And uh, the journals, they are really, really hard on us. So it's, so it's, a, it's a tough job it's really hard to do by yourself. So you have to have, you must have people that are really, really annoying people that <laughs> pay attention in every detail so you don't make any mistake. Yes, thanks um, so much for the comment. I, I, I can only um, um, subscribe to that 100%. So, um, the preparation of the studies is already 50%, even if recruitment and so on takes really a lot of um, resources. But if you only have a minor um, um, problem in the preparation, it can actually um, 
invalidate the whole purpose exactly. of the study. So it better think twice. And mm, the VCN, WCNR is also open if someone needs um, support to yeah. um, get you in contact with people who can help you with your um, with your study design or with anything you you when you have questions. So just don't be shy to contact us. Um, we, we will be happy to help um, because that's in our own interest to really have the highest standard in um, the studies that we pursue um, as neuro rehabilitation um, um, therapists and, and scientists and clinicians. So there was once one question now by Bharati Patil, um, but I, I, I'm not, I maybe don't understand completely. So um, he asked, this study can be done through tailor rehabilitation. So which study do you refer to? I Maybe he already left, <laughs> but I can still see him. So um, I think uh, you, you cannot I'm, really speak I'm, up. I'm here, professor. Hello. Yeah. yeah. So we don't understand the question. Um, the question is, this study can be done through tele rehab, but the question is which study and um, um, to whom is this question? Well, but if he's not asking his question now, I think um, maybe he already left because um, he had the chance to ask. Um, I think um, if there are no more questions from the audience, um, I would like to thank everyone. And I know how, how much work it is to prepare these webinars. It's not nothing you do just um, between, between other things. So I, I would really thank you um, for your um, commitment. Um, and um, of course, um, one of the advantages of, of doing this um, pre-recorded is um, that we have it for later on. So the talks will be also available on the website. Um, so you really have contributed to not only to the audience now, but also to future audience. So thank you so much again. And I wish you an, a nice um, afternoon or evening um, or um, like Korea, it's already late, right? So have a good night and see you um, next. Um, the next session will be on the 7th December. So please uh, save the date, um, the 7th of December. We'll hear about, um, well, it's, um, it's a Woody Allen title and it's called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Clinical But Were Afraid to Ask. So let's um, meet there again. And um, with this, I'd like to close the session and um, thank you again um, and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.